Good morning, church, and thanks so much for joining us for worship this morning. I tell you what, I am thankful to be a part of the family of God, just like that old song says. Thankful to be a part of the family of God and thankful to be a part of this local family of God at University Heights Baptist Church. I'm thankful for you and for you joining us uh, for worship this morning, for continuing to stay connected in these days that we're separated, for continuing to give to God and to the mission of the church and the world. I'm thankful for you and for what God is doing in your life. I'm thankful to be a part of the family of God and this family of God too. I'm excited for worship this morning, excited to proclaim the name of Jesus. Let's sing together now. kids and welcome to children's message with miss abby this morning i'm so excited you tuned in uh, this morning to view my kitchen because we're going to do an experiment um and i thought the best way to do an experiment would be talking about patience or the lack thereof i of all my glories and great things about myself am not a patient woman um there are many things i struggle with in life as we all do but patience is one of them um, when I want something done around the house, I need it done at the time I ask. Um, sorry, Trey. Um, when I have a plan of how my day is going to go and structuring my classroom and how my students come in and get things started and get things going, I am not patient in waiting for kids to be done talking or our friends taking forever to get their supplies. I am ready to learn. I'm ready to go. And I want everybody to join in the fun. Patience, I struggle with. So um, when it comes to like crushing a can, um, technically I could wait and have it done. There's a proper way to crush a can. I didn't know if you knew this. We're going to do it in um, children's message this morning. But if I wanted to not be patient and I was just like, oh, you know what? I have this empty uh, Coke can. I'm just going to go ahead and crush it myself and just move on with my life because I'm impatient. I don't want to wait for a better timing or a better situation or have it done properly. I just wanna go ahead and do it. So I would just go ahead and just like, uh, crush the can with all of my might. Okay? I mean, that's the, that's, that's the best I got, right? There's still some air in there. It's not crushed all the way. I mean, it's the, it's, okay? Um, it's, it's done all right, but it's not done properly, you know? Patience is something that God teaches us. And patience, if done correctly, means you wait on the Lord. So, waiting on the Lord might 
not be in your time frame. Waiting what the Lord says when you pray to God, you might not see the things that he's doing, kind of what we talked about last week, but you can feel him moving. Maybe he's changing your heart. Maybe there's internal things happening inside of who you are to be like, oh, well, I guess I don't need that right now. Or, you know what, God changed my mind and I think I'm okay with this situation, right? Um, patience deals with changing who we are, giving obedience to God and waiting, which can be so hard sometimes, especially when you want something done right and right now. Um, God calls us to be obedient and to wait on him and to be patient. Um, there's a proper way to crush a can and you have to wait and be patient. I have to wait for this to do what it's supposed to do. Um, wait and be patient. So instead of doing things my own way, maybe not the whole proper way, and I just go ahead and do it, I could miss God's words to me. I could miss what God is saying because I'm too busy on my schedule and what I want and what I need. And sweet friends, it's not about us. It's about God. Oh, listen, some internal things are happening in here. It's about God. It's not about us. It's about his timing and his perfect plan for our lives. So that when we fully trust God, and look, if we wait on God's timing and his perfect plan for us, this is a much better crushed can than what I tried to do on my own, right? If I just have patience to wait on God's timing, his perfect plan comes into play in our lives and all we have to do is just trust God and be patient. Sweet friends, I know life is not like crushing a can. It's easy to do. You can crush it with your hands or put it through something metal and could chunk it down. I understand that. But just for visually seeing, God's ways are better than our ways. And when he gives us instruction, when he gives us guidance in the Bible, we need to read it, to listen to it, and apply it to our lives. And patience is one of those things. So many stories in the Bible are about people being patient and waiting on God. And that's not something that just happened in the Bible and we don't need to do it anymore. That's actively how we should live our lives, to be patient and wait for God's perfect plan. Uh, what it has to do with our schooling, with how our relationships are, with how we learn, with how we uh, treat people, um, with how we, if you're an adult, how you work, how you uh, financially do things. We should be patient and wait and be obedient to God because he's called us to. And it has nothing to do with us, but our fact is just be patient and wait on his timing. Sweet friends, thank you for tuning in. Um, I can't wait to continue worshiping in person with you whenever that time may be. Let's go ahead and pray as we continue in worship. Father God, I come to you now and I thank you um, for teaching us patience. It is a hard lesson to learn. God, I pray that we would uh, stop being impatient um, ourselves specifically me and um, how I talk to people, how I treat people. Um, God, allow me to reflect you. Allow us to reflect who you are by how patient we are with people and how patient we are with learning, uh, treating others um, in all aspects of our life. Um, you're patient with us daily, so we're called to be patient uh, to your children as well. We love you and we thank you for this time to continue in worship. In your name, amen.
We believe that worship isn't receiving, but worship is giving. And we believe that God gave us so much that we should give back to continue the mission of his church. Now we want to take that time in our worship service to give you an opportunity to do that. You can go online uh, to the link that's below, or you can mail a check in to the church office, or even drop a check in the locked mailbox there at the church. The most important thing is to not just receive from God, but more importantly, we want to give back and worship God by giving. Dear God, thank you for loving us first and showing us what it takes to love others. Lord, we pray that you'll bless the money that's given. Lord, use it to, uh, to further your kingdom and to bless our community. Lord, most of all, thank you for Jesus, Lord, for his death and for his resurrection. And we ask all these things in his name. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and the rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures for the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. Several weeks ago, near the beginning of our sermon series on James, we got to the passage in James 1 where James talks about, as my son Noah used to call them, money dollars. And now, as James nears the end of his letter, he returns again to this discussion of money dollars. And this passage that we read just a few moments ago is a tough passage. Nobody probably has this passage cross-stitched on a pillow or stenciled on your nursery wall. It's to the point, it's straightforward, and it is a warning. This passage from the book of James is about unjust, uh, deceitful, and bigoted people who use others to fuel their own greed, who manipulate people to feed their own egos and their own bank accounts and for their own drive toward power and authority and control. James, much like the Old Testament prophet Amos, goes on a tirade against these godless, selfish, rich people, at those looking for prosperity alone and using others to get it. And God's message to them, uh, delivered here in James, but 
Also a similar message in Amos 5 in the Old Testament 2 is very clear. Brace yourselves because if you're going to live your lives this way, judgment is coming. And have you noticed that when we read passages like this in Scripture or others like them, uh, and like the one we'll read here in just a moment from the Gospel of Luke, our first reaction is, oh, yes, she definitely needs to hear this. Or, yeah, he definitely needs to hear this. Or, that is definitely God speaking to him. Or, that is definitely God speaking to her. We start thinking about people we know or people in our lives that we think this passage is about. Certainly, this passage is not about me. Uh, surely, God isn't speaking to me in this passage. We, we have to fight that, church. We have to fight that attitude. We have to fight the urge to think that God is speaking to someone else and not to us. One thing I hope that we see in the Bible is that God takes justice and the opposite of that, injustice, very seriously. God lets us know multiple places in Scripture that great expectations come with blessing. And we, every single one of us, are blessed. Most of us have all of our needs met and most of us have more than enough. We are blessed. The theme that we hear in this passage in the book of James is found in several places in Scripture. And one of those places is in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, you can turn that to Luke chapter 12 and follow along with me. If not, you can just follow along. We'll pick that up in Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And this is what Luke records for us. Someone in the crowd said to him, talking about Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this, I will, I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is, those, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This is a parable of Jesus. And if we're really honest with ourselves and with God, and I mean really honest, uh, this parable is way too easy for us to understand. This parable is about people who have so much excess that they have to go through their pantry and their fridge to throw things away because the cans and the packages and the produce have sat unused, for so long that they've spoiled. This story is about people who have enough shoes to, st to stock an aisle of a discount shoe store in a strip mall and clothes in the closet that they never wear. This parable is about people that have more money than 99% of the world's population. We might wish that there were another way to read this parable, but this story, this story is us. It's about you, and it's about me. The young man in Luke's gospel purposefully makes his way through the crowd toward Jesus. He, he's on a mission. He's got somewhere to be, he's somewhere he's headed, someone to talk to. He's used to this. He's used to people getting out of his way, and they do so as he makes his way through the crowd. Like Moses parting the Red Sea, the crowd divides because... Because this is what they do. He's important. He's wealthy. His Gucci brand purple robe flows and stands out in the midst of the Rustler brand neutral colored average garments of most of the crowd. His fancy sandals are expensive and they're elegant. Not like those homemade and discount store versions that other people have. The 20 karat gold rings on his fingers glisten in the sunlight. It's obvious this guy is rich. This guy is in charge of something, and he probably thinks way too much of himself. But nobody dares say anything about that. Everyone wonders what he's going to say to Jesus as he makes his way to him. And Jesus looks up at Israel's Mr. GQ and says, yes. Teacher, 
Make my brother divide the inheritance with me. I want my share. And Jesus answers with a mix of sarcasm and reality. Wow, you're actually enough to have an inheritance. Most of these folks, they don't even have enough for today. And I don't even have a soft, warm place to lay my head at night. The young man doesn't appreciate that. Really, he doesn't even seem to acknowledge what Jesus is saying to him. He doesn't take the bait of Jesus' comment. He answers, I'm not an heir yet. My brother will not give it, even though since the time of Moses, if one of the son and sons insists on the inheritance, it must then be divided. All I want, Jesus, is what I would receive one day anyway. So can you do what I'm asking? Make him divide it with me, Jesus. And Jesus, as Jesus loves to do, answers the question with a question. Who made me a judge between you and your brother? The young man isn't giving in, doesn't even really answer the question. Rabbi, all I want is what is coming to me. I'm not asking for what isn't mine. Just make my brother do what our people have done for generations, please. And Jesus isn't fascinated by the man or he's not impressed by his fine clothes. Like so many other places in the Gospels, the greatest storyteller has a good one ready to go. Has a good one ready to go for this guy. This guy that seems so put together and so incredible, but genuinely seems to lack substance. Everything on the outside was a cover-up for the emptiness on the inside. The fancy clothes are nothing more than a ruse, or to borrow a phrase from my dad, this guy was all hat and no cattle. Once there was a rich farmer, Jesus says. One night the farmer's top hand began to, to bang excitedly on the door. The wheat has exploded, he said. It's grown three times what we ever hoped to get from this year's crop. The farmer, after being woken up in the middle of the night, is so excited he can hardly stand it. I've got to see this for myself. And he and his top hand walk out into the wheat fields, holding a, a torch above and, and in front of them. And the light from the torch tears into the darkness, enough for the farmer to see somehow, some way, the seed has multiplied in ways that he has never seen before, in ways that he has never heard of before. Somehow, some way, he has hit the farmer's lottery. The top hand said, Master, the soil of the earth has given you a beautiful gift. You, sir, have received an incredible blessing. But the farmer heard none of it. Heard nothing that the top hand said. In fact, the words generous and miracle along with everything else went in one ear and out the other. Thinking of himself, he thought, bigger barns. That's what I need, bigger barns. Bigger barns to hold all of my wheat. The farmer shouted in the middle of the night, waking up the rest of the workers, we have to build bigger barns to hold what's rightfully mine. The farmer didn't sleep anymore that night. He was too excited. He was too excited about what was now, what was now his. So he went to town the very first thing in the morning. He hired carpenters to come and to build those bigger barns, and he hired blacksmiths to build special locks for the barns. And when they came to his farm and saw the incredible abundance of wheat, they told the farmer, my Lord, what a miracle. You are certainly blessed beyond measure. But the farmer didn't hear a word of it. He was only concerned with the security of his new bigger barns. He wanted to make sure nobody got what was his. Usually at the time of harvest, the farmer would hold a big party for all of his workers to celebrate. But this year there was no celebration on the final day of the harvest. As soon as the last grain was put into his new barns, the farmer fired all of his employees, leaving them unemployed and searching for a new job to feed their families. As he secured the final board and lock, he figured that he would never have to work another day and that he would never need another thing and that he would never go hungry again. And Jesus, in only the way that Jesus can, gazes at the young man who assumes he's nothing like the farmer in the story and says, the farmer never did go hungry because the farmer died that night. What do you think is going to happen to all that was rightfully his? Whose inheritance will it be now? Hmm. Goodness, the story's tough. 
The farmer in Jesus' story seems to be a successful, albeit lucky person who worked hard and has been rewarded. He has put all of his grain into his own barn so that he could enjoy his retirement. What's wrong with that? And yet Jesus calls the man a fool. A fool. Can you believe that? The farmer sure seems to like looking in the mirror, especially when he's been blessed with all this. And the young man does too. The young man's concern never seems to go past the end of his own nose that he looks down on everyone with. And when the farmer's top hand bangs on his door one evening to tell the farmer the good news, sharing that with others is the absolute last thing on his mind. This parable and its application can go a lot of different directions. But I want, us, I want us to think about the very thing that the farmer stores away, and that is food. Food. It's nearly impossible for folks like you and me to understand what it's like to starve. For most of us, that's absolutely impossible. We have a hard time even imagining what it might be like for another person. People starve, and we in the United States throw away $165 billion worth of food every single year. If we were in pre-COVID world, we would leave church today after I finished preaching here in a minute and after we finished our invitation, we would leave church and we would get in the car and we would get caught up in the same cyclical argument that we always get caught up in about what restaurant we're going to choose to eat at after church while other people starve. Some people in the world don't have enough food to stay alive, and we have so much food that we have to count our calories. Or to quote the great theologian Chris Rock, we got so much food in America, we're allergic to food. <laughs> Hungry people ain't allergic to anything. You think anyone in Rwanda has lactose intolerance? <laughs> I cut out the more colorful, colorful words, but you get the point. The UN reports that about 27,000 people die every single day from hunger or hunger-related illness around the world. 27,000 people per day. Right now, we're losing 4,000 to 5,000 a day to COVID, and that's horrifying enough, and that's awful enough. Now imagine five, six times that dying per day, all because they didn't have anything to eat. That is a nightmare. And herein lies one of the biggest problems. We so easily write things off as their decision. That's their decision. They, they've gotten in these situations by their decisions. And we assume people are in these sorts of impoverished situations because of drugs or because of money choices or because of lack of education or because of lack of work ethic. And I would say that even if, if that is right, and I'm not saying that it always is or that it even often is, but if that is right, what about their children? What about the kids? Are their children the ones who should pay the price? Are our are, are kids some of the most, most vulnerable people in all the world and in our society and in any society, the ones who must suffer to the point of malnutrition and what science teaches us that they're literally their brains are smaller because of the lack of access to the correct quantities of healthy food? Are we okay with that? I have never, never gone to bed hungry in my life. Quite literally, not one single time have I gone to bed hungry. But tonight, all around the world, and even here in our own country and in our own state and in our own community, people, many of them children, will lay their heads down tonight and try to push thoughts of hunger out of their minds. Hunger and poverty are just one, two issues really, that this passage speaks to. There are literally dozens more. And herein lies two important points that James makes in this passage from James 5 and Jesus' point in the parable. And those points are trust and blessing. Where does our trust lie? Where do we get our security from? Is it in Jesus or is it in bank accounts? Is it in Jesus or is it in stuff? Is it in Jesus or is it in buildings? And what are we going to do or what are we doing with all that we have been blessed with? Are we going to trust in Jesus or stuff? 
It's easy to say Jesus, right? That, that's the Sunday school answer. That's, it's easy to answer Jesus. But it's another thing altogether to really do that. Our church, University Heights, is blessed with an incredibly beautiful space for worship and theological education and ministry. We're blessed that every bit of that is paid for in full. We're blessed that we have money in the bank and money in our foundation, but is our hope and our trust and our security in those things, or is it in Jesus? Because if we're walking by faith, if we're walking by faith and we're trusting in Jesus, our hope is found in him. And we're willing to say, God, all that we have is because and from you. And, and, and we want to make much of Jesus and, and we want to be a part of your kingdom work in the world. And we're putting everything that we have, everything that we have, we're going we're gonna to put it on the table for you, God. Everything that we have, everything that you've blessed us with, everything that you've given us the ability to obtain, and everything that we have, we're going to put it on the altar for you to take and for you to do something even better and greater with, to, to bless people, to grow your kingdom, to help people know and to trust in Jesus. Blessed as people, blessed as a church, we are blessed. What are we doing with that blessing? You are a generous people, and this is a generous church. I, I know so many of you give over and beyond just a tithe. I know our church gives so much away, and that's good. And that's what we should do. We should be a generous church. We, we should seek to always be a generous church because we serve a generous God. And we can't live tight-fisted while others are in need. We have to put all of that on the table, all of that on the altar for Jesus. What are we willing to do without so that others can have their most, most basic needs met, including knowing the hope of Christ? I read a quote by Gandhi this week who said, There are people so hungry in the world that God cannot appear to them except in the form of bread. And I thought a lot about that this week. I thought about how does that idea translate into our message as believers? Because I think Gandhi is on to something there. How, how can we tell the thirsty about living water if we don't first give them water to drink? How can we tell the hungry about the bread of life if we don't first give them something to eat? We can't make a difference for everybody in the world, but we can make a difference for some. Jesus concludes his story with the death of the farmer. That's how Jesus wraps up his story. Because death, after all, has a way of reminding us what is really important in life. And maybe if we're reminded of that too, we can imagine how that story correlates to our own culture and to our own lives and to our own time. And and not just about food and not just about water, but about a lot of things in life. Maybe if we place ourselves within the story, we could imagine a more promising ending to the story. We can imagine our own better ending to the story. You all probably remember that song, Imagine, by John Lennon. And sometimes it's good for us to imagine, to imagine how things might be different, to imagine a better ending. To imagine hungry people being fed by believers who were willing to set aside some of their own wants to meet the needs of others. To imagine some of those people giving their lives to Jesus because a believer cared enough to give them bread to eat and then told them about the bread of life. To imagine a family willing to foster children or adopt children out of terrible situations and imagine those children growing up knowing what it means to be loved and cared for rather than forgotten and abandoned and unloved. Imagine believers and families of believers willing to fully and completely trust Jesus, not just with their heart, but with their whole lives. To imagine a church who is willing to fully and completely trust Jesus to lay their lives, to lay their buildings, to lay their money, to lay everything on the altar so that God can do something even greater than they ever imagined with it. To lay it all on the table so that even more people might be blessed by God's grace and God's kingdom. To lay it all on the table and willing to trust Jesus enough 
to, to, to go and to make much of his name and his grace and his gospel to the community and to the world. Church, let's trust God fully and completely. Let's trust God enough to say, here is everything that you have blessed us with. Here is everything that we have. Now go, God, and build your kingdom with it. Let's pray. God, we're thankful, so very thankful for all that you've blessed us with. And God, as we take stock of what we have, we're reminded, God, that there are those who, who don't have. That there are those in need in our community, in our world, of many different things. God, remind us that your good news is good news to, to every bit of us and to every bit of a person. That it's good news and physically, that it's good news spiritually, that it's good news emotionally and mentally. That your good news is powerful. Help us as a church. Help us as people to say, God, here is everything that you have given us. And we put it all on the table. We lay it all at the altar for you to go and to make even more with it. To go and to do even more with it. To go and to build your kingdom. Help us to trust you enough for us to do that. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.